November 5th's Cloud 2030 discussion was about the edge and then morphed into vertical integrations of industries in an amazing, uh, powerful way. Great discussion. Uh, stay tuned and enjoy it. If you have more topics, we spawned a whole bunch of topics out of this, open source, uh, inequities in, in code distribution, uh, more edge. Uh, come back, the2030.cloud. We're looking forward to talking with you there. Thanks. It would be interesting as a, so the four sessions coming up, I was going to come back to open source um, as a session. And then, because um, I always feel like, I feel like we were, we're starting to turn around the circle. Um, but talking about, you know, um, the externalities, big, big events and crises that we had a lot of conversations early and uh, post-election, it might be might be worth coming back and discussing that when things are, are settled. You don't need open source, you need open borders, right? Have that as a discussion. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, you mean the United States of North America? Sure. <laughs> hey, Rob, is there yeah. any way to work in those conversations the effect technology is having, whether open sourced or paid product, um, on the inequities. I don't know, we've had conversations about inequities in technology, but the inequities that technology bring as to why you have this divide between, you know, a farmer or a rural person in Montana versus someone that lives on the coast or in Austin, right? The difference between people that are that can work remote, that are not affected by pandemics and the in the whims of government intrusion, in a lot of ways, versus those that feel like that they're being left behind. I don't know if that's anything, but because it's not an it's not a U.S. only thing now; it's a national thing, right? I mean, it's a global I, thing. I I definitely want to have the we we had one pass. I think Gina, yeah, Gina's here. I'm here. We had one pass on the inequities discussion, and I feel like we got started but we didn't move very far towards you know sort of the, what those are Keith, i'd love to have that um and we we need to i guess gina you and i can sit down keith if you want to come i'd, I'd appreciate the input yeah on, great um, yeah, it's definitely extension of that same conversation for sure yeah because you can't talk about all of these border issues i mean i'm sitting here thinking about the border issues and I'm, I'm thinking about we talk about border issues we never talk about a lot of the native issues that come from the border issues and I think the native vote is what's going to swing things one way or the other in some of the and some of the states we're waiting on so we've never seem to talk about that but I think all of it's related all of it is related to the inequities who gets to play I just uh, posted a thing in the chat by the way I agree with that that I just posted a note which you have to read. It's really just fascinating. So this is an article with this guy called Martin Gurry. Um, basically, the argument is that this is America's Arab Spring. So go read, it's good. I'm capturing it in the notes too. Oh, I need to share the notes page. No wonder nobody else is typing in it. Wee. Ah, <laughs> that's one of those days. All right, let's see. Um, topic, the topic for today was, was going to be edge. Um, it's edge week, um, edge infrastructure <laughs> week. We're all on the edge of our seats. Ah. <laughs> worse, or, worse, or, worse or better than shark week. <laughs> Uh, it's it's just as hard to pin down and likely to become a part of a tornado so yeah yes. there you go there you go edge nato i like it edge nato oh <laughs> all right that's the winner for the whole the whole day you won the day can, can i ask a question about edge um as we get into the topic uh, as someone okay. yeah. who still is trying to understand what our purpose of edge is Earlier on, I did some R&D work for when I was at a company and we were working with a vendor who was doing some research about using edge compute in farmland. So they were doing some studies about how to, you know, put the edge compute to the, to the vehicle, I mean, to the, to the tractor in the field 
and be able to track information, leveraging 5G and all that stuff to, to basically try to get more information, more data to drive production, right? Yeah. Is, have we finally gotten to a point where edge is seen as something that is no longer this far out R&D innovative thing, that it's more of a practical extension of the technology re, re, reimagination of America and, and understanding that our actually commerce, mm. you know, that everything is technology. I remember working for, had a client once that said, we're not a technology company. And I remember sitting back and going, you're, you're an idiot if you, don't, if you really think that, right? <laughs> Just because you make food doesn't make you not a technology because everything is. Have we gotten to that point where technology now is in everything we do? And is edge compute part of that extension? That was my question. I love that question. I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. Um, I mean, I think that question could be, um, you know, the whole session today if we wanted it to be. Um, but, you know, quickly from my perspective, um, edge, uh, if I were to boil it down into two main things, edge, um, is an opportunity that has always existed um, uh, for many of the things that are being targeted today, but the the, the tools and and um, and sensors and video and network capacity, et cetera, et cetera, weren't there at the right price points or capabilities to justify those actions. So people have always wanted real time data about how their factory floor was operating. People have always wanted. Uh, the ability to manage traffic in cities better. People have always wanted to get more real-time data about the environment that they're in um, or uh, be better connected with healthcare or emergency services. All of those things have always been there. Just like all of the things we do on the internet, we're all there uh, even before 1995 when it became a reality for more of us to be able to actually start using them and building those things. And so, but then, but then, Mark, the question is: yep. If you're going to go and build those applications, what are you going to use? Are you going to use some service delivered by AWS, uh, or are you going to use something that you make yourself? Well, it's funny. That's, that's actually that's actually the first question um, I meant to ask the panel today. Okay. I have opinions on that. Um, I don't know <laughs> if I uh, completely um, answered your question, Keith, but, um, but before. before, before before you, if you have a question stage, before you do, I want to chime in on what Keith said. Okay. Before I lose the thread, mm. before the thread moves on. Because I wasn't, I was still answering. So if you, can oh, I I'm just sorry. say one more thing for Keith? Yeah. No, I didn't mean to cut you up. <laughs> so, um, so Keith, the 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 reality of Edge. Well, I shouldn't say the reality of Edge. The opportunity of Edge, from my perspective, and you could pick any one of a thousand different perspectives on on what will drive value and plenty of business opportunity at the Edge. But from my perspective, um, the edge is an, is an incredible opportunity for businesses and organizations of all types and sizes to provide a better and more responsive um, uh, uh, and engaging environment for their customers, their partners, um, their suppliers, their supply chain, et cetera, all under the pretext of business transformation or what everybody calls digital transformation yeah. The prime focus of that activity, the prime focus, I don't care what anybody else says, I will argue with anyone, the prime focus of that activity has to be finding better ways to engage the customer, whether that's faster turns on information inside the company, whether it's better quality product coming out, whether it's um, a better integration of the customer with your, um, your product development, whether it's all of those things and more. That's got to be the focus of business transformation at the highest level from my perspective as such. And this is potentially a great question for the rest of the crew, as opposed to just letting Mark pontificate is, is edge the logical extension in many ways of this new paradigm of, of greater, a real time customer engagement because of the capabilities of modern technology. And so that's where I see an amazing value of basically giving the, the uh, I've used this, this analogy a few times now, but giving the corporate body, if you were to think of it as a human body, um, where it's very flat, you have to reach out and touch the body via a flat web page or a phone call or something like that historically, um, and give it hands and arms so that it can create the kind of connection with a customer that you and I might create by shaking hands or embracing. 
Can I give a succinct version? <laughs> <laughs> no, the details are very important and I don't mean to sound rude by that. Um, Edge is now the extension of the enterprise to all of its ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely, Joanne. Mm. And, I like and this is but the, the the point I was the point I was going to add with this to Keith's to Keith's question is I think Edge has been here for a while, mm -hmm. and right it's it you know except for really some very small companies most 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 people most companies are actually interacting with phys the physical environment and building physical stuff, um, and so from that perspective. There is no edge computing is a is a silly distinction. It's yeah. just they're, them doing business. But mm -hmm. when we talk about edge, what I think we're actually describing is IT arriving in the environment that already exists. And so it, it really is an ITification of of technologies that are that we're trying to place into your businesses and homes and the physical environment. Um, and we're like, okay, yeah, it's actually tech. IT manages technology, and that's that's to me where when we talk about edge, we're just talking about the ITification. Yeah, but why is that edge versus cloud? I mean, <clears throat> the big the big counter argument here is most people are kind of stuck with web page like response times, and you know you can build rich big things in AWS, and so. What we have to do for Edge, I think, is cover this unique ability to deliver, right? That is, it needs to be a lot easier or faster or cheaper or something than just building some shitload of stuff up in AWS. I think there's there's a kind of peeling the onion back. God, that's a corporate metaphor. Um, the, the, look, looking at this from a historic perspective, um, I think some of us are old enough to have survived the, you know, glass room versus the PC, right? Mm -hmm. Having having your data center versus the PC started to distribute compute power through the organization. Yes. So I look at the cloud as the new glass room, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the cloud is a, you know, it, it may it may be in different geographic locations, but it's a monolithic compute entity. <clears throat> And the edge is the latest iteration of pulling compute out of that glass room, right? Um, so it's, it, it continued nope. democratization, maybe the wrong word. I don't look at, ah, I, yeah. I really don't want to get into business process. No, but that's it. Yeah, that's just not right. Okay. But that's a perfect term because, you know, last night in doom scrolling, I was watching this thing on YouTube, but, you know, every John Deere tractor is, basically a, a driving bunch of tech, right? And yeah. the farmers, they can't fix these damn things anymore because John Deere won't let them. They're like Apple iPhones. And so, you know, the, sure, there's edge compute. If you think of a tractor with a bunch of tech and it, there's edge compute, but it's talking to something in the cloud or wherever. But so it's, is democratization? Oh my God, no. no. That is the farmer is definitely out of the loop and he's in a much more expensive process he always has to pay john deere um and so is edge on the device is edge packaged into devices in general or is it a general purpose facility around the cloud i think so, the edge is the anti-cloud uh, oh, oh, oh. so, so i don't know so i'd like I don't know to know if i agree with that i'd like to uh, comment <laughs> that was a hand that it's it's not democratization if Edge is also at such a point where Simon says, is it cheaper or faster or whatever? No, what it is, is it's allowing these large corporations to gather every, yet more sure. data constantly Great. on people. And that's what, what their cost uh, analysis is. Is it worthwhile now? Do I make enough money off of the data I get to put something more intelligent in the consumer's uh, immediate location. Sure. That's, ex that's exactly it. And just, I want to go back and talk about like, I think some of what Keith was getting to way back in the beginning, 
if when the farm when the uh, when the tractor companies do this and the seed companies and everybody else and they collect all this data they get the data which is about farming and the people that know the best how to to deal with the plants and the crops that they are planting and the regions they are in and all the rest of it are these people that have learned from generations how to do it so if you take the the historical knowledge of a particular um, body of, of, of work and you you mine it for the data and you push it into algorithms, you don't get as good of a product as before and you totally leave out the people that should be intimately involved with fixing the things and building new things and, and all the rest of the things for their particular body of work and the things that they contribute to society. There's, you know, I, I think I've said my, my, uh, my kind of view on, on edge here a couple times before, but to me, what's really important about edge is the pattern of flow, right? It's a pattern of the movement of data. So it goes very long with what you're saying, which is, you know, the, the being able to, um, to both deliver data to and collect data from more end nodes by distributing the workload of that distribution into, you know, ever decreasing and increasing sizes, depending which direction you're going, right? Like nature does, you know, and that's but, the limb, but, limb, but, right? Sure. All of, but, but, but Google I mean, does this, right? Google does it. And so does Amazon. And so does, and, so, and by the way, they're not into edge or list. Well, they are, but that's, I mean, you say, I mean, at least Amazon definitely <laughs> is. Amazon has an absolute strategy on edge and you can clearly see it. In okay, our... let's go. Tell me, what is their strategy? Well, their strategy is to host it. It's not, they don't have the services oh, no. to do the work on the edge, but they're, they're, they absolutely have an increasing number of smaller data centers. Oh, sure. Across the <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, and they're partnering with all the 5G guys. I get it, yeah. Let me, let me talk about uh, Amazon's strategy is is to own every transaction from its source, right, to its sure. death, period. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's right. no... Or, Rob, a slightly different way of saying that, I agree with you, but the slightly different way is they want to collect every piece of data from the source into the core because that's what sticks. Data gravity yes. is AWS's strategy. Well, it's every cloud, right? If there's a chance to collect data into AWS, they want to be in that business. Yep. I agree well, with so, that. Well, data, there, gravity, some... data gravity is part of it, but it's it's stickiness at the interfaces. So whether that's data or whether that's customer experience or whether that's the pipes, everybody's got a, a piece on it. Uh, I wanted to go back to the farming analogy because that, that's actually a good edge use case is mm -hmm. that you think about John Deere creating a platform and they're, yes. they're, they're leveraging the stickiness of the tractor Within that tractor, you have uh, sensors, you have GPS devices, so you can track location. You've also got integration with uh, weather company APIs that have information on climate, yep. that have information on weather, that have information on um, soil concentrate, you know, mineral concentrations. All this stuff is all brought together, and it's this platform that John Deere. Um, and IBM essentially through owning the weather company have, right. have control over. So that's that's the control layer that they have. And, and you know, Amazon's doing the same same kind of thing, right? Yep. But they may be grabbing different points of stickiness. I I, I mean, it really goes <clears throat> right back to Clayton Christensen innovator dilemma and that that control of the interface, like, you know, the, the Microsoft versus Intel wars, right? Where each, each company had a piece of the overall platform and they're ever to leverage that into near monopoly power in their space. But then isn't that in a way also going down the road toward the analogy of edge becoming another channel? If you think Sorry. about retail and the omni-channel models that are being put out all over the place, you know, first it was the web, it was the PC, then it was the web, then it was a mobile device, whether it was through RSS or SMS or any of, of the protocols, then it became a, an application stack. There's still all channels of outreach to 
consumers, suppliers, trading partners, et cetera, the whole ecosystem of an enterprise. Now, the way you're going down this road, and John Deere is certainly not the only company, uh, Stanley is doing it, um, Milwaukee Tools, there's a bunch of large companies that are involved in a well, similar kind of capability. In very way, much around GE. Yeah, yes, Emerson, absolutely. Johnson, Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all doing it. So in, in my earlier comment that the edge is becoming the extension of the enterprise, it's also in many ways, and I think there's probably 10 use cases that I could talk to, all of which propose that edge is becoming the next channel. Is it a next channel or is it a method to, um, to get to the other channels? In other words, does edge so I guess the question is, is Edge a vehicle or is it the engine behind the vehicle? It's both. Oh. Hmm. All right, but Mark, you're very quiet and looking very dark. I really... <laughs> <laughs> is it, you need to answer some of this stuff because you're our expert. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't go that far. There's a lot of smart people on this call, smarter than me. <laughs> um, All right, but, you're, but, but you know what? In the spirit of having a lot on the line, edge works or you're dead? Uh, to some degree, that's true. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, I would argue, I would argue that's true for most all businesses, actually. Okay. At, at some level, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, to, I, I, I literally, you know, I, I wrote down like 10 questions and then I threw them all away and then I wrote down three and I may use two of them. Um, and so I'm going to start with <laughs> one that we, we hinted at. And, and the truth is, it's really hard, guys. I mean, um, even for those of us who live and breathe and sleep and swim in Edge all day long, um, uh, you know, Simon and I, Simon's been worried about Edge for as long as I have, and the two of us sit down and talk about it, although sadly we haven't done that in a while now. Um, and we can easily take something that appears to be the skin of the problem and, and go into a discussion that lasts two hours. Mm -hmm. And so the opening up the can uh, of worms that is edge and what it means and who it's important to, how we'll get there, who will benefit most, et cetera, et cetera, is not an easy 45 minute or hour conversation. Um, so I decided to try to focus on one area that I feel continues to come up on Twitter and sometimes on these very um, video pages and others um, that the, the, the foregone conclusion is that is is two is twofold, but basically goes back to the same thing, and that is that edge um, is dependent on cloud, and that the cloud providers will enable it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's and you hear that point. a lot. I mean, you hear that a lot, and um, it the you know the public cloud providers will take care of the of the of the control plane. The 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 application design criteria is the same, and and. Right your deployment models will have to be the same and so on and so forth. And, and I've seen edge as everything from a, a simple raspberry Pi running somebody's proprietary code, doing something right. successful at the edge to somebody running VMs in distinct um, distributed infrastructure sets to people trying to build edge, the equivalent of a distributed horizontal scalable, manageable edge cloud and people trying to do that with tools like OpenStack and, and Kubernetes um, and everything in between. And I, I believe that there are opportunities for us to lower the barrier to entry to Edge. And I believe there are opportunities for us as a, as a, as a tech, tech society to enable better decision-making around where and how to use Edge. I do not believe that it's a foregone conclusion that the public cloud providers own edge, the strategy for, for, for making edge work or the best uh, format, nor are they financially incented right now actually to create the best format for edge computing. So that's sort of a statement and a question that I would love to get debate on. Well, they sure as hell want to be the platform. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But, that, but that doesn't mean they own it. And <clears throat> actually to, I think Joanne's point, it is the customer of the cloud service providers. And what we're talking about is the kind of the edge services and, and the edge technologies that are that are 
basically enabling enterprises to create new forms of business and new business models. I'm gonna reference something that may sound odd in this context and, um, and that's Shoshana Zuboff's approach to surveillance capitalism. What she identified was the notion of taking data exhaust stuff that people didn't know there was any value in mm -hmm. and turning it into arguably the biggest powerhouse companies in the world today in the course of about really 20 years. Right. If you wanna think about edge and the edge platforms as an enabling technology for enterprises to create, I'll call it edge capitalism. You've got <clears throat> GE that no longer charges you for the airplane or the airplane engine, but rather for the number of flight hours. Mm -hmm. And the way they make money is by maintaining that, that engine and making sure that it is available as much of the time as it as it possibly can. You're talking about much the same with John Deere. They're right. putting they're putting the we're no longer the the farmer uh, the agricultural enterprise is no longer buying a tractor. It's no longer buying a piece of right. farm equipment. They're buying services of that piece of technology. <laughs> they are paying for it like it like they would capital equipment. It is a new form of economics. It's it it enables a new form of call it a you know call it edge capitalism. But I think it's I think that's what we're uh, that is really what we're talking about. And that the infrastructure, the services that we're talking about is they're the enablers. They're the things that we're we're building this on. So, Rich, given that move from from capital, you know, capital spending on services, does that foretell a changing in how this kind of equipment will be sold in the future and how Absolutely. farmers will pay for it? And and think, what kinds I of think, things would you? Expect? Oh, it is, it's in place already. It, it I mean, already is. Yeah. And and, and by the way, these them. tractors just drive themselves around the field because oh, they yeah, have GPS, there's TVs right? and there's TVs inside the cabs because the farmers get so bored sitting in them. I know. And yeah. air conditioning, really good yeah. air conditioning. <laughs> good air conditioning, yeah. Sure, but soon you won't need humans, right? Right. right. But, but your to your question, um, I would, James, I I absolutely think it changes not just the way we buy those kinds of equipment, I think it changes the nature of kind of the way it's gonna end up modifying the way we think about accounting and what our assets and what is on the balance sheet. Okay, so gonna change, well, it's that, gonna change. But I, I still spend no, a ton, I, I spend a ton of money on an iPhone and I get a bunch of the services for free, right? So, yeah. so yeah. That, doesn't, oh, that doesn't foretell that much. Uh -huh. Wait a minute, well, you get the services for free, but somebody's monetizing the data in another way. Exactly. I mean, sure. Okay. Nothing is free, That's right? That's fair. Yep. And, yeah. and the this, farmers this, this, this are, are revolting not... against John Deere and their, their model. They hate it. Uh, so the question is whether there's a, an open source equivalent for the farmers that they can migrate to or not. Right now, there mm -hmm. isn't. But well, how, how much blood can you squeeze from the turnip before the, the, the... <laughs> yeah in this case literally yeah i agree yeah well, we go, we go back so, to we go back yeah. to economics 101 right you yeah. know it's supply and demand and we're looking at a monopoly curve instead of a perfect competition supply and demand curve yes so, uh, the, i want to cut so, in on, on tyler so, sorry uh, so I I to to my, my point will, my point will hold so John Deere has, they've got more than just the plot, the, 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 the tractor. So they're able to, and to drive monopoly like market power because they have distribution networks, right? So their whole supply chain becomes their competitive advantage. Yes. Right? And, and, and that's, that's that you, we see it across industry after industry after industry. I mean, so, 30 years so the supply ago, chain for with real estate and sale leasebacks, right? Yep. I mean, okay. Can I interject something here, Tyler? To your point, it's not about supply chain anymore. 
It's about value chain. And if you think about the traditional <laughs> supply chain, yep. you go from materials through logistics and blah, 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 blah. And by the way, I come from a deep manufacturing background. You flip side that model. And this will answer, I think, a couple of other questions that were raised as well from the economic models. If you use a value chain model, you're going from the customer towards the material. So back ass words of supply chain. And if you look at the way these business models are being developed, whether it's Black & Decker or Milwaukee Tools or John Deere or any of the other major US manufacturers that are doing this, including GE, the as a service and data as a service model is very customer centric and it's bringing the consumer slash business customer closer into the product design and all the manufacturing for a very specific reason. If you know what your customer wants as early as possible in that value chain model, you can design for the customer of one, which is the root cause of mass customization. And you can start leveraging all of the data around that as part of that same platform. Mm -hmm. So the yep. monetary model, and I do this on a regular basis with a lot of companies is if I ask the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's, I want to be a digital business. Well, what does that really mean? I want to make money from data because I have two slim margins. I can't produce the same quality of goods for the customer of one as I can in mass manufacturing, which is an oxymoron phrase, but actually does make sense because you know a red, a blue, a green, and a purple are quick customizations that are actually just a configuration. They require no extra spend. So CapEx is just OpEx, okay? Right. But if you have to, if you look at it deeper than that, um, in that same notion, being the company that produces the revenue from the data in all of the various ways that one could manipulate that data into a product set, that's where the CapEx for technology becomes the OpEx with a return on value three to six times greater than what the ROI on CapEx would be. And just to use as the harbinger of that very model, that's exactly what Google did. That yep. is exactly what Twitter has done, what Facebook has done with the individual consumer. Now you're, that was my reference to, you know, mm -hmm. the surveillance yes. capitalism. What we're now talking about is exactly what Joanna has just pointed to, and that is the, the creation of value around data. Actually, I'd say as much about metadata as data, but yes, well, mm -hmm. that, that's another conversation. The point being, this is actually going to be happening in conjunction where very, some very big concerns are kind of carving out their piece of the ecosystem. And when you're talking about agriculture, let's you know, let's not forget, you know, the Monsantos and ADMs of the world who right. actually own intellectual property to the point that they control in great measure how an agricultural concern can use the seed that they're growing in their in their fields. Right. Exactly. I think another thing to think about when you think about these industries, I mean, farmers have always been the ones that they know how to fix everything or they figure out how to, they create something new if the tools they're having, they've been given aren't working. So there's right. a big technical um, loss of skills if, if this, this is another like side effect of this happening. Mm -hmm. Well, actually in one respect it isn't because in different countries, that body of knowledge is actually being captured and leveraged to promote the industries. The UK is mm -hmm. a good example of that. I'm sorry, what is a good example? The UK. Yeah. Agribusiness in the UK is a very big part of its economy and they are the earliest adopters of what I would call the edge capital market to use your phrase. Um, and that's where you have the giant conglomerates that are actively pursuing that body of knowledge to repurpose it and almost in a way create a circular economy model by leveraging mm -hmm. that, mo that so, knowledge back. Yeah, this is what Tyson is, is getting involved with. Right. Uh, 
in a big can way. I, can I ask you a question? Just is in the um, John Deere example, then are, is the farmer then the customer or they no. just labor? No, yeah. Uh, exactly. they're, 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 they are labor paying for, paying for their, their, uh, their ability to be labor. Yeah. Actually, they're value add. Oh, value add. Okay. They are, they are one of the points of value creation and value add, not only for their knowledge, but in their uh, creating the food products that everybody profits from. But they're, the but they're driven down in terms of their take. That is, they're driven down to the cost of labor as we automate more, right? So, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not they're, really they're, value they're, add. They're, they're the moral more. equivalent of gig economy workers. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uber drivers. Let's, let's not forget the consolidation in the farming industry. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, having grown up in eastern Iowa, man, and in the 80s, uh, the, the, everybody talks, you know, about, uh, you know, not to get into a political discussion, but they talk about the difference between rural view of the world and, and city view of the world. And a, a hell of a lot of it comes from the fact that um, there are fewer people kind of running their own small businesses yeah, in those environments, and, and the skin in the game is really different. Well, they're desperate, right? Really different. By the way, the link I post posted in the chat, go read. I mean, mm. you know, it's the same for them. You've got to believe that in rural Iowa, they're feeling the same pressures as the Uber driver, right? But yeah, just express yeah. differently. Well, that's that, not I easy. absolutely agree with that, Simon. Absolutely. It's not easy either because my like I have very very good friends that are farmers, uh, very very small or you know, farm that's been in the family for since before Florida was a state, um, and it's, and they're older. It it doesn't pay to be a farmer, and so you've got like uh, there's all sorts of just knowledge and and skill that's being lost to all of this too, which is a shame when all, when technology should be enhancing all of it and preserving that knowledge and making a good living for people that want to provide our food for us. Well, it's, it's the same yeah. trend we saw at the beginning of the first industrial revolution with, with tradecraft. It's the same dynamic and it's based on the power of the platform. In the first industrial revolution, it was about using mass production and factories to be able to drive price points to, to get the individual business people and trades people out. Uh, and we're seeing the same the same dynamic now with the third industrial revolution. Okay, Mark. So if I could so tie that you. to the, I'm sorry, Simon. <laughs> if I could tie that back to my first question, then is that does technologists have a moral and kind oh, of good. a wise responsibility to ensure that there is a transition, or if we're if we're improving things to the point where you can't make money doing the thing that was part of your family for years. How do we help with that transition? How do we help solve the problem of that fear that, hey, I can't yeah. do what I normally do. I, I, how do, am I going to feed my family? Right. I, Keith, that's a great question. Uh, I first wrote about that. In fact, it's probably still to this day the blog that has the most readers of anything I've ever put together. Um, and I think it was titled The Coming Tidal Wave of, um, of Employment. Um, and the, the, Many of the differences that we see today, and from my perspective, are that the change is driven at technology speed. It's not driven at traditional um, the speed of industry of the last hundred years. So, or human instance, speed, right? What's that? Or human speed, because right. we are, you know, we we don't evolve that fast. Right, and so if you think about, you know, a, you you run a fishery in Oregon, and um, the 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 size of the catch continues to go down you've probably got a 20 year period before you make a decision about whether you need to move somewhere else or quit the fishing industry. You know, you've got a whole generation of your family or yourself to get through before you make that decision. In technology, um, you're lucky to have five years um, in many cases. And um, the unfortunately, there's something else I wrote about just recently. I wrote it at the beginning of the pandemic um, before um, it was um, the, the discussion du jour um, is that the pandemic uh, made every CEO uh, sit around uh, or sit at the virtual table with their executives and ask the same question. What's our constraint? 
Why aren't we delivering product? Why aren't we building product? Why aren't we shipping product? And the answer from the executive team would be our constraint is people. I and once, that's once that's that, um, we we're already on that trend, but once that becomes, um, sorry, my video is out of focus. Once that becomes the, the accepted knowledge that we, if, we, if we don't accelerate our process to automation, uh, uh, greater robotics, um, uh, you know, fewer people in control of services, that it's gonna kill our business, the, there's no turning back. And the, the last thing I'll add to that before I'll get off the, you know, my piece of the topic is that we, even for me, it's really easy to look and say, oh, well, that robot took a job. Okay, well, how many jobs in theory did um, uh, uh, functions in Excel take? Yeah, did, I, and that's the, they, the... I mean, it's a it's an open question. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, right? But I mean, we 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 target as humans, we target those things that are exploding a bombs in front of us or truck crashes in front of us that are really easy to see. But every single day, we do things that, in theory, eliminate someone's job, even if they create two other jobs. So this I, is I think there's one of different. the, Go ahead, the James. sorry. Let's just say real quickly the the favorite blog post that I ever wrote, not the most read, but certainly the favorite one that I ever wrote was um, one on which I, I sort of identified a term that I call clerk jobs, which are jobs where you take something off of a queue that's that's placed before you, you do some prescribed action that you don't have a lot of control over what the, what the recipe is, and then you pass the end of your work on to the next guy's queue, right, or the next thing's queue. Those jobs are systematically eliminated by technology. So to your point, Mark, absolutely those Excel functions took a lot of accounting jobs and reduced, reduced the need for the computing function within accounting, absolutely. And, um, and mm -hmm. I still see a large number of clerk jobs. I mean, if you look at Uber and the gig economy, I believe those gig workers are in a lot of trouble because they're basically clerks. Yep. right now right Absolutely. taking the job off the queue dropping the person off taking the next thing off the queue worse worse um, yet james really so quickly worse yet they are known clerks they were hired to be that throwaway clerk. clerk that's the part that pisses right, me right right that's the part that's really scary and right, but so, so, so that point then that that's what i look for when i look at technology i look for how adoption how will adoption affect employment if it removes clerk jobs does it create other types of jobs where people have more control of the functions that they take, the creativity comes through or, or a deep level of expertise comes through where there's some, some investigation power that needs to be done. And, you know, and that's what makes me think like, is there a net gain in jobs in the future? Well, only if we change our education system and at this point, in my opinion, but, um, but we are eliminating clerk jobs like super yeah. fast. So that's not the question I heard. <laughs> you guys are answering ahead, the question Gina. that Keith okay. said. That's not the question that I heard. So why, as technologists, if we see that specialized fields are being destroyed by the technology that we create, what is our responsibility? And I know in the chat, um, we were talking about the laws and, and how this impacts and the patent laws and everything else. I think that's important. Labor laws are important. I mean, I know California just went through a great big thing right now, trying to even up some of the inequities for these clerk jobs, quote unquote. If you look at where this is going, if we don't look at it, people, women, minorities, people that are poor right now are not gonna get the chance to do anything while they have the talent to do everything. And supposedly technology is supposed to be this great leveler. And it has nothing to do with education. It has to do with giving, at us looking at what's going on and making sure that everybody's brought along and we don't we don't say well it's gonna it's gonna we're gonna lose some jobs it's not about the number of jobs it's about the quality of life for everybody no i agree with that and so there's a whole nother topic for another time but i, I would love to have that conversation with you because i completely agree with that statement. so i agree with that but then arguably there is somebody there are probably 10 million people in the world who could do your job and so if you say the internet is a big lever, sure, let's go find the 10 million. They'll work for less than you do. 
And that's the problem. That is right? the problem. It's exactly right. what uh, I'm saying. That is the problem. So the so, converse so, of that problem, if, if I could just a second, right. is that part, part of what our technology does, part of deep learning and, and, and automating sensor integration is what we're doing now. It's not AI, it's sensor integration, right? Is that we're, we're eliminating baseline jobs. So it's the learning jobs that are in the next step to creating the expertise. I think all of us on this call, there aren't 10 million people in the world who can do our job, but we got here by starting out doing much more basic things. And what's happening is the entry level positions are being taken by yeah. automation. And yeah. that I think is what's fundamentally changed. It's not yeah, the so occupations that, are changing, right? So if the, um, if the entry level is automated, then the leap is bigger for somebody to get to say your job. It's harder, absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. Rich or Rob, you were gonna say something earlier. I, I, I have a point about access to capital. Because the thing, the thing that when we've been having this conversation, I, I keep hearing behind the scenes is that for big interests, access to capital is cheap and they can, they can leverage the edge technologies and AI technologies and use of data in ways that create economic windfall because they have the capital to invest. And then you look at the subscription model on the other side and it literally destroys capital value. So, right, like if, it, going back to the farm, if I bought a tractor, I bought a tractor for 20 years, I get returns on that tractor. If I'm leasing the tractor from John Deere, who's harvesting the data and all that, I never establish any value. They set the price at high enough that I have a living wage and that's it. So and it's so turning part us of, all into digital sharecroppers. And, and I, I think part of what is surprising to me out of the edge conversation is that we're actually moving towards this place where the edge is advantaging people who have easy access to capital. Yeah, but that's always, to, yep. that's to get that's more control. Been, I'm not sure that that's true. I think uh, equally I, I advantageous sort of, for small companies. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I think to Gina's original point. I want point, that though, to be true. There, no, yeah, there's Gina's not hearing point it. is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of folks that are using this to drive the cycle of like, we want to turn over land to go to, to so we're going to use you at least model, put you in a constraint and be able to pull your land. And this is how all the big agri farmers are doing this is be yep. able to pull and consolidate land. That's the game plan. It has nothing to do with the crop you grow. <laughs> right? Don't even get started on water. And yeah, water rights is the same thing in California. It's all about water rights. They don't care about the land at all. And the, <laughs> the key about good, John but... Deere, to Rob's point, is that John Deere is requiring the farmers to actually buy the tractors. They have to buy it. They can't lease the tractors, but then they have to buy all the services. So it's the company store right. model, the sharecropper model, and it's right. turning mm -hmm. all these clerk jobs into sharecroppers who have all their money goes back to the folks who have the capital. Yeah, so it's even capital. worse. It's, it's, it's a capital investment plus a leasing model. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Right. Both worlds. So, I mean, I, you, I, yeah, you purchase from a rent taker, right? Yep. <laughs> That's exactly right. You, you, and and you, this is, but this isn't unique for farming. I mean, this is happening uh, in other oh, industries. I mean, happens yeah, in Uber, right? You have to that's, buy the that's car. what Uber is. You, we'll finance you to buy, go buy your car. You go use oh, your car I, to provide the services. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the finance agreement is so egregious. It's not even funny. It's like, yeah. Six eight hundred dollars yeah. for a little compact car per month. Yeah, the fact that they got away with that is just criminal. I mean, oh. it's like I, I can't say a lot because I built I built a bunch of internal infrastructure for Uber, so <laughs> far be it from me to say anything. But uh, and yeah. the other key is is that California actually voted that proposition in, which actually was not to give the gig drivers more control. It no, was no. actually to eliminate laws that would have made them real employees and given them access to benefits. And this- yeah, Don't even get, don't even get me started. That I is live here. crazy. Right? <laughs> oh, I live in yeah, California. I, I don't understand how nasty. you can- Yeah, it's, uh, and, and the fact that it requires, what is it like seven eighths? Seven eighths. Eight, seven eight, seven, eight, 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 seven eight of the legislature. It, I, so I the, only, so that, the only way well, we solve that, that part Rick is- might get thrown out. <laughs> Well, we don't have to. What it's it's just this this is the fun part, Rick. Is uh, you and I we can start up our next proposition signatures to uh, revoke the seven eighth requirement in the in their proposition. 
It's just, right. if you want to play that game, we don't want to have representative democracy anymore. Okay, we'll play the proposition game. We, you and I, we can start the and, next signature set that says I eliminate. Remember that, it, that it did not address really the larger problem uh, that is actually being faced by, um, quote, gig workers, basically independent contractors throughout the state of California, many of whom are not driving cars. Yep. They are they are independent, they're 1099 contractors who are, who are basically losing the ability to operate in that fashion because of AB5's Right. Bad, yeah, I mean, like bad. if you're a writer, you're if you're a right independent writer and reporter, you're, you're really screwed. Well, so this, this actually goes back. Sorry, guys, but this actually goes back to the point about um, uh, uh, the speed of change, right? When you think about the um, the fact that other jobs might be created, um, when the fishery went away after 20 years, the fishermen's children um, could get a career in accounting. That exploded, you know, when when um, when paper handling went away and computers came in, et cetera, et cetera. Those kinds of jobs exploded, and you had a twenty-year, thirty-year, forty-year period to make that transition. Mm -hmm. What will a bunch of twenty-somethings and thirty-somethings do when they have no other skill set? Um, their only their only asset is their car. Um, the, some of them have maybe foregone any kind of college. And uh, they they end up on the um, on the street with no um, health care or anything like that, no retirement, um, and uh, they're going to be expected to get into what new job? There will be new jobs created somewhere, creating the software that makes uh, the auto autonomous vehicles more successful, or delivering services in those autonomous vehicles, or whatever it is. But none of those people will get those jobs and that turnover will occur over a two or three year period. It won't occur over a 30 or 40 year period like it has historically. Actually, though, it, it's already started. Um, there's a big trend which you may not be familiar with called lights out manufacturing, which is since the, yep. I would say the last 12 months, in particular, the speed of business has accelerated so quickly. And given the pandemic, CEOs had to make a choice. I can't keep my workers in a factory operating, even if it's the cleanest factory in the world. I have to move them oh. off site. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still recovering from COVID. Um, and <coughs> pardon me. Anyway, <coughs> my point was this the workforce displacement that automation has created is already underway. In my country, at least, we're trying to re-educate that workforce, a lot of it coming out of automotive, where we're moving those people into green tech and clean tech because the skill set transfer is transferable. And we're also starting new industries of our own, like the first Canadian-made car, Canadian source, Canadian design, Canadian built, period, full stop. That, for us, is a huge deal. But that transition of workforce displacement is something that I've been writing about for five years. And I see it coming more and more because the faster people have accelerated digital transformation, <laughs> the faster this is happening. So lights out manufacturing. Last year alone, there were 185,000 industrial robots put in around the world. Each one takes 10 jobs to 20 jobs. Do the math. You have whole sectors of unions that are going to be laid off in the next two years, or they're going to have to be retrained. So in our case, in the Canadian economy, we're moving them into green tech. It's a national initiative. Um, mm -hmm. we're yeah, that's, creating that's one of the things the U.S. really lacks. And the opportunity for us was really around infrastructure investment because, you know, we did our first investments back in the 1930s. Yeah, <laughs> we haven't accelerated right. anything from there. And, no, and, right. and this is really, this is really an opportunity for the U.S. as as a you know totally as a bipartisan thing. I don't think this is anything um, about. And then and then right. we created shared baseline infrastructure that people were able to build up and around. Right. Yeah, it's standardization was huge in, in terms of moving the economy forward. And I think there's there's this, a, an equal opportunity there around clean tech, clean energy, moving product around. Yeah. Uh, and these and these are all local. To Simon's point, these are all you can't build a construction project with people remote in China. You no. can build part of it. 
like you can build bridges, you can build parts that are assembled for things like that. But the reality at the end of the day is when you're building a road, you're building a rail system, you're building dams, you're building waterway distribution systems, electrical grids, you need people on the ground to make that stuff happen. Uh, you can absolutely have innovation to make it better. So to Joanne's point around just automation and robots to make things as a better pure product, but you still need people to put it in the ground or to, or to hang it or to you know, do whatever. And I think there's a there's an opportunity there for us to sort of meet the needs uh, on the midline. I think that that part is actually missing in the farming community. We don't have advocacy because we all want to have the cheapest possible price for the food that we consume as, a, as opposed to the quality of the food we consume or the, even the you know environmental impacts of the food we consume. So there's a bit of a revolution happening there, but it's so small and grassroots. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if it's going to take over a, on, on a bigger basis unless unless maybe it has a significant climate change issue or a water change issue uh, and everything in California is water. All right, so. all right. And we we are out of time. So I'm going <laughs> to let Ed be the closing closing word on that. Everybody, we have a lot more to talk about. Uh, Mark and I will coordinate on edge tech focus conversation <laughs> um, be, because these but I think what we're talking about is the actual fundamental truths of cloud 2030 more than which yeah. tech wins. This is, this is the thing we actually need to be raising. And I appreciate everybody's very honest, sincere and open discussion about it. So. I never knew edge was a political movement, but they go walk. Oh, wow. <laughs> something important. That's, that's another definition of edge. It's a, it's a, it's the, uh, it's <laughs> the edge political movement. <laughs> exactly. It's both a symptom of and a catalyst for. Yes. It's a, it's a question of who's going to own this. And today, the dotted line says Amazon. It's going to be Mark, and he's in Las Vegas. Yeah. So, well, that's, that's, that's the edge NATO uh, effect. The, the, the yeah. platform may be owned by Amazon, but I, I the question is, will they move up into some of these areas, or are we talking about the GEs or the Monsantos of the world, or you know the national grids, uh, yeah. building on top of that, not yeah, not it's... not the not the e-commerce kind of foundational roots that we we saw. With ah, them. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think the and infrastructure versus the awesome. <laughs> Ten, <laughs> and Amazon. The There's your next topic, Rob. There's your there next you topic. Go. I go. love kind of I love I love meetings when when everybody ha wants to keep going. But yeah, you know, thank I'm you gonna, guys. I'm gonna close it down for the Bye. week. Talk to you guys later. Yep. Take care. Bye.